I'm a believer in the self-sovereign identity movement. I think it's, you know, time that people take control over their own data, over their own identity. I personally believe your identity is not just a government uh, agreeing that you are who you claim to be, but it also is your reputation that can build over time. And we should all be afforded the ability to be portable, whether it's by choice or in some cases, unfortunately not. But your reputation and your actions matter. Um, so your digital identity should build up over time. Welcome to Smarter Markets, a free weekly podcast featuring stories from the entrepreneurs and icons of commodities, capital markets, and technology, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we explore the question, is capitalism in crisis, and will building smarter markets be the antidote? Welcome to Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast that explores how financial and technology markets can be redesigned and improved to better serve market participants and society as a whole. Smarter Markets is brought to you by ABAX, and I'm Michelle Dennity, your co-host and guide through the intersection of privacy, security, and digital technology. We are delighted to welcome Sarah Clark the Senior Vice President of Digital Identity at MasterCard to the program today as we continue to examine the evolution of digital identity and how self-sovereign identity specifically can help bring trust and privacy back into a consent-based economy. Sarah and her team are laying down a global, interoperable, reusable digital identity network at MasterCard, and she believes that trust and identity are the foundation to the continued expansion of digital user experiences. Spoiler alert, I agree. Stay tuned. The latest installment of Identikit Sequence X is coming up next. And now back to this week's episode of Smarter Markets. So welcome, 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 Sarah Clark. I'm super excited. We have been dancing around each other's schedules all summer. So I'm super excited to have you on the show during Identikit X. So welcome and uh, tell us a little bit about who you are. Introduce yourself, Miss Sarah. Yeah. So first, thank you for having me. I'm really thrilled and excited to be here. I do listen to the podcast, so it's a big joy for me to be featured on it, I guess. Um, So what I do is I head up our digital identity strategy and global business at MasterCard. So we are working towards building another network um, that extends our payments capabilities into identity. And I'm thrilled to be here to tell you more about that and our perspective on the industry. I love it. So let's just get into it. So identity You would think this is a simple, easily defined, universal understanding. As we know, it is not. How do you approach identity? And then after you're identifying identity, let's identify digital identity. And is it the same? Is it different? Oh, that's actually, I guess to your point, it's a question that's more complex than meets the eye. So I've been personally floating around the identity industry for a number of years. And I think if you would have asked me that question a decade ago, I may have had a simpler answer. (laughs) But being engulfed in the industry, especially with digital identity, It's very fragmented. There are issues with inclusion. I think that at this point, many of us know that there's a billion people on earth that essentially have no identity because they don't have a government issued identity document, which is sort of the the foundation for all of that. And when you think about identity and what it means in your life, it provides you the opportunity to access pretty much everything, especially as the world is going digital. Uh, which COVID, of course, continued to escalate globally. So your identity is really your ticket to inclusion, uh, whether it be financial services, whether it be travel. And um, if the underlying foundation isn't serving good people well, um, it can become very problematic very quickly. Uh, So identity is something that we need to have injected into our digital lives so that it's more effective so that it uh, serves real people well. 
And so that it also is combating, you know, fraud well, uh, which is also a rising vector. So it's so important. And I think that people that aren't in the industry sort of maybe take it for granted a bit. But when you really start to peel away the onion, there's a lot there. There's a lot of issues that we need to solve. And uh, there's a reason why it's getting tremendous innovation attention as well as investment because there, there's a lot to solve for, but there's also a lot of opportunity to make a lot of people's lives a lot better. I, so you've touched on some of my favorite themes, of course, which is you know inclusion, opportunity, services, innovation. And let's go about this two ways. I, I actually was, um, I, I ordered a book yesterday about the Dominican Republic's approach to documentary identity. And they've, uh, and I don't, I haven't read the book yet. I did watch the, uh, the debate, but apparently they're in many parts of the world. To your point, there are undocumented over a billion. We don't know what that number is because they're not documented. And then there's other people who are shuffling around. There's about 65 million people on the move from, you know, fighting climate change or, or places of conflict, et cetera. And so the question that they were debating was, what are the rights and services that should be granted via a government issued or even a social issued ID if you are born Haitian living in Dominican Republic? born Ecuadorian living in the United States, um, whether or not, you know, without getting into, you know, the political footballs around these things, what does it mean to be identified? And that's sort of a, I think, a hierarchical political climb. And then what does it mean to the person? And I think this is where it's fascinating to me that a company like MasterCard, my identity in my pocket is purchasing power. It's freedom and some safety from not having to carry currency that can be easily alienated. It's a sign that I should be allowed in a, a restaurant or someplace where they charge money. Um, so I've just thrown like 17 different PhD thesis level questions at you, which is my norm. Since you, you, you warned me that you did listen to this in the past. So pick one and let's go from there. How do we solve the, the high low? And then how do we solve the individual? Yeah. So I guess just let me start by your comment about MasterCard conceptually being in the identity business and the value that, you know, a corporation like MasterCard brings, because I know this is a series on self-sovereign identity. And I also know that uh, for some of your listeners, it might seem like, you know, kind of a conflict, like having a player like MasterCard sort of injected in a movement that's all around giving more power to the individual. So there's, I guess, to our earlier point, there's an interesting tapestry around uh, the requirements around proving your identity, uh, what you need to have to gain access to what type of service. So some of that's regulated, some of it's not, some of it's to build trust on the internet. I think we all see that more trust is needed and, you know, we can talk more about that, but misinformation, I mean, there's all sorts of themes that we could dive into. But an entity like MasterCard can really help further the evolution of the topic, whether it's inclusion oriented or first world oriented, because the concept of you need a digital identity in order to be included in society, whether it's through an NGO, um, if you're a displaced person and you want access to you know, services or whether you're in a first world country and you want to do an Airbnb, the core concept is the same. You need to prove that you are who you claim to be so you can be provided with a specific type of product or service. And uh, from a personal level, I'm a believer in the self-sovereign identity movement. I think it's you know, time that people take control over their own data, over their own identity. I personally believe your identity is not just a government uh, agreeing that you are who you claim to be, but it also is your reputation that can build over time. And we should all be afforded the ability to be portable, whether it's by choice or in some cases, unfortunately not. But your reputation and your actions matter. Um, so your digital identity should build up over time. But the, the pure form where every individual has their identity and they can interact with those who can 
can verify certain things about you and those who want to verify things about you is not scalable. So that's where uh, MasterCard comes in into play. I joined a year ago, um, and my choice to join was really driven by the vision of bringing scale uh, to this concept that as individuals, we should own our identity, but it's a tremendous problem in that, you know, the ecosystem is not any more safe unless you have an entity that, uh, you know, uses good faith practices or, or good practices that are looking out for the best interests of society and people uh, to connect all of the dots that need to be connected. I mean, if you just even think about, uh, and I'll get back to your question about displaced people, but if you think about those of us that travel, you're traveling across different countries, different borders, different airlines. There's a lot of dots that need to connect, be connected. And the ecosystem isn't any more safe if those dots are unknown. So sort of at a high level, my job at MasterCard is to bring a governance framework to the concept of enabling people to own their own identity, uh, whether they're an inclusion use case or sort of a first world uh, use case. Yeah, let's let's dig in deep on a governance framework because you know I'm a girl who loves a good governance framework, and I've worked with uh, one of your colleagues, the wonderful and brilliant Joanne Stonier, for many years talking about data privacy, data ethics, governance, accountability, and quality of data, and and quality as you know depends on circumstance, right? So, what I need to buy a magazine, do I have fifty cents? I'm I'm dating myself. Do I have twenty dollars <laughs> to get it to get a magazine? Um, what do I need to um, receive uh, specific, very specialized surgical services? I, I hopefully they verify, re-verify, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're approaching a governance framework for something as broad and yet human as an identity, how do you start to bring that? to an organization that people largely think of as, as in the Fiserv category. It's to me, it's always been also about human rights and services and, and access to basics. But MasterCard, I think, you know, wherever MasterCard is, right, it's like the, those great commercials of, you know, priceless, right? So how do you take a very business concern and a very priceless um, aspirational outcome for each one of your individual many, 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 many users, including myself, and, and put a governance framework. How do you start? Well, I guess the first thing that I would say is our ID network is completely separate from our payment and our credit network. These are separate businesses. Our experience, scale, you know, governance uh, experience, um, ability to create an acceptance network are all experiences that make us uniquely positioned to really help the identity ecosystem. But it is a new business with its own attributes, and there's no direct dependency or direct carryover. You do not need to be a MasterCard card holder to participate on our ID network. We are following the guiding principle that every individual, you know, certainly we're executing market by market. So it's not like everyone in the world can suddenly join our ID network. That would be, you know, unreasonable scope for us to start <laughs> with, but- um, A lot of scale. <laughs> uh, right, that's a lot of scale. We'll get there, but we're starting in select markets. And, you know, every individual has a right to a digital identity whether or not they participate in our payments network. So I just want to make that very clear that they're completely separate rails, separate businesses, and we are handling them as such. I love that you're bringing that out, though. I, I'm sorry to cut, cut you off a little bit, because before you go into that, I just I want to underline that and circle that, that it's possible to have two separate businesses that are reliant on similar technology, similar technique, but what you're talking about, the outcomes are very different in these two things. So I, I, I think that's something that a lot of people would not guess about this being two separate businesses. So thank you for that. The outcomes are very different. The businesses are very different. The experience and the scale and our connections within the 210 countries we do business in and the payment side certainly carry over to a certain extent. I am leading the identity business, so perhaps I'm biased, but 
identity is very complex and it extends well beyond payments. And in fact, the use cases that we're starting with don't generally include or require payments. So when you think about the problem set of transforming our ecosystem, like the fundamental question is, are you who you claim to be? And how do we make that easier, more secure, and more interoperable on a global scale? We're choosing to start with use cases where there's frequency, where there's need, but that aren't even directly related to payments. So as an example, we're helping to secure the education ecosystem. Um, and that's a demographic that, you know, clearly we're interested in because they can grow into understanding it and developing utilization for it. But it's all about enrollments, test taking, making sure that that's secure, um, as well as vetting that the user experience is easy. Another example where we see self-sovereign identity really being needed, and to your point, the cross-border use case is travel. You know, of course, you have to pay for travel, but most of your touch points don't require payment. Um, it's all about making sure that you can prove you are who you claim to be in a way that's safe, secure, easy, and, uh, you know, minimizing contact, I guess, during COVID times. So um, identity uses our experience from payment, but it's a very different uh, problem set. And I'm forgetting what your original question was now <laughs> that I was supposed to answer before we went off on that tangent. No, so. it's a great <laughs> tangent, actually, because we were talking about, you know, MasterCard, you you think of as payments, but, but this identity and self-sovereign identity coming from a, a company with that recognizable brand, it's sort of one of these echo chambers of, I need to prove who you are, but I know who you are because you've got this long lineage of, of brand and, and company. So with, there's some trust baked in. And, and then your applications that you're talking about are, are exactly what I wanted to talk about is, you know, for young people who have to identify either online or in some states, they are required to be vaccinated. In other states, they're almost prevented from being vaccinated. And I don't know how adults deal with this, much less children, much less their ID providers. So how do you reconcile with those moving targets? It doesn't have to be that moving target, but it's always evolving. This is what I call wicked privacy, right? A complex, lots of humans, lots of change requirements, and, and somehow you're governing in the middle of that. How do you govern in the middle of that? Yeah, so you're touching on some of the themes that led me to even join MasterCard in the first place, and that is trust. And, you know, just the concept of identity and what it can mean, how it can be weaponized, um, how it can either be used for or against the best interests of people. And I joined this industry a while ago, kind of by accident. I was head of product at a company that was looking to pivot into another space, and we found the identity use case, and I got immersed in the industry. And I genuinely believe that although today we don't really see that young people or people in general are that concerned, at least by their actions, on their data privacy and the questions of trust and who has your data. I really believe that that's an emerging concern when you look at everything that's happened with social media, when you look at, to your point, sort of the vaccine you know, debate about carrying your credentials, whether we should or should not be able to use those to be granted access to different types of services. And it's really important that a governance framework exists that is protecting the interests of the individual in terms of data privacy. So at MasterCard, we're certainly following those principles. Um, as you very well know, data minimization, only sharing what's needed is a key part of that component. So when you look at, you know, why are you really being requested for your vaccine credential? It's really to ensure safety for a certain type of user journey. And it may not only be a vaccine, it could be a COVID test, it could be something else that excludes you from even having to uh, participate in that requirement, you know, whatever the policy may be. Uh, one of the keys, I think, to protecting individuals is data minimization, uh, consent, and transferring what's needed to support the use case at hand and doing that in a responsible way where that data is not being tracked, where honeypots aren't being collected, where we're not contributing to data breaches. 
So uh, I think it's tremendously important that we evolve the ecosystem around those concepts. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to say that we are following those types of responsible protocols. And that's part of what drew me to this position, uh, because I've always wanted to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. But I think it's, you know, it, it's unclear exactly how all of this is going to go down with respect to the vaccine protocols. People do want to travel internationally. They want to be safe. We are participating in various initiatives to help facilitate that. But, you know, I look at it from a lens of always in the end, moving the ball forward when it comes to protecting your data privacy. The policy is the policy. Companies, travel companies, what have you, have a right as private organizations to set the policies. But, you know, we also need to continue evolving to a spot where people are protected, uh, where we're not a surveillance state or a surveillance world. Um, and how do we get there? I think that responsible digital identity and the self-sovereign movement being implemented in a way that it can scale is definitely part of that ecosystem going forward. Yeah. And, and you're, you're touching on all my, my personal biases because there's, there's no normal. I think it's hilarious to talk. How are we going to get back to normal? What the heck was normal? Was it pre-Vietnam? Was it, you know, back when there were kings and queens and pharaohs? I, what's normal? So I, I think moving on, as you've said, is this won't be the last thorny issue. <laughs> this being starting new school year in the middle of uncertain health conditioned times. And I think what we hear from every responsible person is we are not going to stop wanting to see each other on other parts of the planet. Now that we know that there's another side of the world, we're going to get there. So we're going to intermingle. And that means intermingling social as well as credential, as well as generational credentials. So as you've touched on, the younger people seem to be sharing a lot, but boy, when you dig into them, they're pretty proficient about designing a persona and signaling who's in the cool kids group and who's not. And my teenagers every day shock me with, oh, this little finger gesture is like from 1990 and the way you do your eyebrows shows that you're blah, blah, blah. I'm like, geez, Louise, those are all identity signalers. So as you're going into this, this world, two questions, because of course, why, why one? <laughs> two questions. One is, how do you plan to govern a multitude of signals that alert someone to a specific contextual identity while minimizing, while creating enough context to get to consent? And then the second part of that question is, do you think it'll always look like a piece of plastic card? And if not, what's that going to look like? So no, I don't think it'll look like a piece of plastic card. I think your identity is more complex than a payment instrument. Um, to your point, it starts with the fundamental question, are you who you claim to be? And for some of us that live in countries that have governments that are responsible and innovating and evolving, there are, you know, increasing biometric ways that you can sort of check that with a, what we call a root of trust. Um, and that's sort of the foundation. I am Sarah Clark. And in the U.S., you know, we don't really have a centralized identity ecosystem, but we do have the DMVs and they are starting to innovate towards biometrics. So fundamentally, I can attach to my uh, DMV biometric and assert that I am who I claim to be. And then that can be layered with additional attributes about me that can come from a variety of, of different sources. So foundationally, it's not like a piece of plastic, it's more complex. And in fact, I would even say that one of the evolutions that we're seeing in the industry, which we should see, is sort of a return back to the traditional physical wallet, in a sense. So we've seen a lot of innovation with digital wallets for payment. And now we're seeing that sort of open up to, okay, your payment instrument can be used from a digital wallet what about everything else that's in your regular wallet? So this extension to an identity wallet where, you know, conceptually I have my driver's license or my ID card, which can be vetted against the authoritative source. 
uh, layered in with other things about me. Am I a member of a loyalty club? Uh, do I have a traveler certificate? What tribes am I a member of? Do I have a student uh, status? Do I have an educational degree? Have I rented a home with a good record? My reputation can layer in. So there's all sorts of things about you that it would make your life a lot easier um, if you could put it all into an identity wallet. Um, so conceptually, it's about ensuring that the sources that those attributes or credentials are pulled from are, in fact, real and reputable sources. And that's one of the ways the MasterCard can add value. You know, you it's not just about verifying me, Sarah Clark. It's also about verifying that the entity who says I graduated from, you know, University X is actually University X. Um, so vetting the sources, vetting the providers of the credentials or the attributes, and also vetting those who seek to verify me. This isn't sort of a one-way problem where it's just the individual who could be falsely claiming about themselves. Uh, phishing is a real thing. It could be the verifier is looking to extract my information to perpetuate fraud against me. So the governance uh, framework is meant to both protect the uh, verifiers or those who want to, you know, allow me to do business with them. But they're all, it's also meant to protect me that I'm not being taken advantage of by a verifier claiming to be, I mean, we've all seen these texts. Sometimes I get ridiculous ones from Amazon saying I'll win an iPad if I do you know, something ridiculous. And, you know, being in the industry, I don't personally fall from that for that. But clearly, those are sent out because people do and they need to be protected as well in the other direction. So the governance framework, it's complex, but it's multi-party. And it has to do with having really deep checks for all sides of the network, for all roles in the network, not only ensuring that we interoperate so that we can trade data, but to ensure that those data exchanges are done safely and in the best interest of all parties. Yeah, I, I think you bring up so many good things because I think the mistake that often is made uh, at self-sovereign identity uh, it's often dismissed as poo-pooed because the consumer has too much to worry about already. It's too hard. It's too complex. But what you're talking about is a network like any other. So just like I can put a spam filter and I can do run antiviral software on my devices, what you're talking about is really the human connection of veracity and saying this is a complex multi-party screening, looking for anomalies, looking for specific answers to Q&As. And, and then, you know, leading me to my next question is, you know, where does all of this fit with the future of distributed ledger and quantum? And, you know, blockchain's a, a subsection of DISTI, but do you need that much compute power to do this type of identikit for the future? Well, I think the pure self-sovereign architecture certainly relies on blockchain as um, a key component. And I'm not going to claim to be a technical expert, so I understand the cryptography layer sort of to a certain extent. But it certainly depends on distributed ledger, blockchain technology, decentralization. And, you know, within the field of decentralized identity, there are different ways that you can implement it. So the pure self-sovereign identity movement, I guess, or architecture, we could call it, certainly has a specific uh, blockchain-based architecture associated to it. At MasterCard, we are moving forward in market today uh, because when you really think about self-sovereign identity or a reusable digital identity, it's not just about the underlying architecture and the way the keys are exchanged, et cetera. It's all of, also about creating a new user habit. Um, it's about introducing basically a new user journey. So we are choosing to uh, enter market today while much of the self-sovereign architecture is still relatively nascent to begin verifying, refining, testing the user journey while also engaging with companies that are furthering the specific architecture related to self-sovereign. So our general uh, vantage point or our position is 
that we embrace open standards. And that can mean the standards that exist today, but it also means we're deeply engaging with the self-sovereign movement of the future. So do you need a high power, you know, architecture, quantum computing to pass identity info? No, probably not. But do you need to be always considering the network effect that can add value to the ecosystem? Yes, definitely. We have to always keep in mind that we're not just doing it to do it because it's cool. We're doing it to solve real problems in real people's lives. Uh, so making it easier uh, for people to participate is a key problem, but also reducing fraud is a really key problem. And there's been a ton of innovation with respect to digital identity. Can you prove you are who you claim to be using, you know, different emerging techniques that exist? Yes, you can. Uh, I used to drive a business on that front, but, you know, in tandem with that, innovation has been rising fraud. Um, and one of the best ways that we can overcome that is by uh, being more deliberate with governance, but also by really utilizing a network effect to mine out, you know, anomalies and other things that that require a network at scale to really be able to recognize these patterns and to be able to be effective because fraud is a big business and, you know, we need to continue to invest in reducing it. Yeah. So as you're talking to me, you're hitting on a couple of different cylinders, which is there's, there's Geeklandia who are geeking out and loving what you're talking about, <laughs> bringing all of these technologies. But there's also what you're bringing to the table is a lot of human here, right? It's how do you drive what you're talking about in the, the very beginning, the haves and the have nots, the disparity of the haves. You know, there are very wealthy people who live next door to each other who are treated very disparately based on what they look like and who they love or all sorts of different things. So how does all of that humanity and, and the techie stuff, how does that come together for you? Is this like a deep, dark past uh, Sarah Clark story that, that got you to this epiphany? Or is this just years and years and years of doing what works for the customer, really? Actually, I love that point because we have not touched on just the power shift that digital identity can bring to the world. And, you know, I'm sort of diverging from official MasterCard position, maybe, but that's all important to me from a personal level. And, you know, it's really not that divergent. I mean, part of why I joined MasterCard is because of a reputation that's steeped in doing what's right. And, you know, it's been a joy to discover that there really is a commitment to diversity and culture and all of that. But from a personal level, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about digital identity is exactly what you said. It can really shift power away from centralized entities back to individuals and create a level playing field, like going back to the concept of data minimization. Um, if I'm sharing what I need to in order to apply for a job or, you know, apply for education, other factors about me that maybe I couldn't prevent from sharing before uh, may no longer be a factor. So these are all outcomes that, you know, may not be my specific focus while we're trying to spearhead a commercial business and vet user journey and meet certain use cases. But in terms of the vision for the future, um, I think these are very powerful and meaningful. And, you know, I'm personally at the point in my career where I want to make an impact on the world that's more than just dollars. Um, so I think there are so many just you know, I could go on forever, but I won't. But there's so many good outcomes that can result from a responsible digital identity ecosystem. And, uh, you know, part of the reason I'm so excited to be driving this at a company of the stature and uh, position in the global market as MasterCard is because if you do it with the right design, the right intent, these outcomes over the course of the next, you know, 60 years will uh, continue to evolve. It'll take a while. Uh, if you look at credit cards, you know, this problem started, I think, in the 60s, right, where issuing banks wanted to issue their own cards, and it was a mess, and a network stepped in. So this isn't a short game, it's a long game. But, you know, one of the outcomes is leveling the playing field and shifting power away from honeypots, away from corporations, back to individuals. 
Well, and even as society has changed, it's really not that long within my lifetime that a woman, a married woman could not get a credit card without the co-signature of her husband, whether or not that husband was any better economically or any any more fiscally responsible. And in many cases, not because the woman, as we've seen, often is the, the power, you know, the CFO of the household. I myself named both of my daughters gender neutral names. So I think there's various ways that we behave in our society to gain a slight access against existing bias. And then the question is, as you're building out your governance framework for a self-sovereign identity, how do you gut check? How do we check against our own biases as, you know, women of a certain age today uh, versus what I think in 50 years uh, my daughters will think is ludicrous? Yeah. uh, Well, first, let me just say I'm watching The Handmaiden's Tale and I'm like reminded of how easy it is to go backwards. And that's a great show for anyone that hasn't seen it. But, you know, I I don't know if I have a brilliant answer to that. I think combating bias starts with awareness. So uh, certainly I'm engaged, MasterCard's engaged in groups that are looking at, as an example, bias in biometrics, bias in uh, AI and machine learning. The risk we all run is that our biases actually become stronger as we automate through these technologies as opposed to creating a more level playing field. So uh, for me, step one starts with awareness. It starts with uh, responsible leadership where you're investing in measuring and overcoming and finding KPIs that show that you're moving it past you know, the point where it is today. Bias will probably never go away, we're humans, but awareness, measurement, and moving it forward are the keys, at least in my mind. So how do, how do you hedge against some of this change? I'm going back to the smarter market side of our, our hedge fund guys and our investor guys. How do we start to look at the indicators of what's going to be powerful? What's going to be popular? What's going to be uh, investable with a self-sovereign identity? Is it is it a leading indicator of travel? Is it a, a, a corollary of how much ice cream we want to consume because we're depressed or how much alcohol we're going to stop having after we're out of lockdown? I, I'm just all these sort of consumption-based, uh, business-based, there are correlations here. And I'm wondering, how does this fit into a smarter market in terms of predictability of both consumption and and abstinence, I think. You mean, why would investors want to invest in self-sovereign identity? What are some of the key business KPIs that that the movement's generating? I think that's one question. And then the other is, how do they leverage the inevitable metrics coming out of this? Because I think it shows a different lens on that that's outside of pure dollar transactions or currency transactions. How does this add into the fold of what is a sound or good business worthy of investment? Yeah, so I guess maybe a couple of comments. I'm not sure if I'm exactly understanding your question, but I have a couple of comments based off of what I do understand. Um, I think first and foremost, this digital identity, decentralized identity, self-sovereign identity is getting investment, is getting innovation because it does contribute directly to top line and bottom line today. And that's important because, you know, you need money to innovate and money, you know, fortunately or unfortunately flows from the, you know, top line and bottom line impacts of today. Um, So self-sovereign identity, decentralized identity is driving friction out of the ecosystem and it's driving fraud out of the ecosystem. So there are measurable impacts that my team and many teams globally are involved in measuring. The other thing I might say more on the sort of, you know, humanity side is data privacy legislation is coming into effect. We saw that with GDPR. Um, One of the most notable uh, developments in my industry in recent months has been the EU continuing to be on the leading edge of this movement and uh, making uh, assertions that they're going to further their movement towards an EU ID. And by doing that, they have um, implicitly sent a message 
that they will be supporting a self-sovereign identity ecosystem and uh, furthering their commitment to the data privacy of their citizens, as well as maybe it could be interpreted as a bit of a negative uh, <laughs> slant towards some of big tech. So there are uh, movements that are happening by various governments. I'm pointing to the EU as the most visible example recently that are continuing to sort of pair that top line, bottom line innovation with kind of doing good when it comes to data privacy and the interests of individuals. And self-sovereign identity, decentralized identity sit you know, squarely at the center of all of this. Yeah, I, I'm so excited to see the juxtaposition of of self sovereign ID. So me as an island, and yet me picking up rights. So if I'm present in the European theater, I am subject to the protections of GDPR. If I my identity is there and my body somewhere else, I think we've got all sorts of interesting issues. And and I think we're getting further and further. This is my own personal bias. So take it for what it is. You know, 25 years ago, if you'd asked me where we were in 2021, I would have said we've got treaties now recognizing that identity is something global and detached from your, where your feet are currently sitting on the planet that should be following you everywhere, much as you could take, you know, back in the day, American Express traveler's checks. That was the way to, to not exchange currency everywhere you went and, and have to pay for that privilege. Then you had credit cards. And now self-sovereign identity um, takes it to that next nuanced level. But we don't have treaties that say everything looks like the European theory on identity. In fact, we have really diverse thinking here in the United States versus Brazil versus Canada versus what's going on in Asia right now. And I, and I see actually self-sovereign identity as sort of being a unifier, right? It's forcing these countries to recognize that we want to be human beings apart from who we are as citizens. Yeah. And I mean, GDPR had far reaching consequences outside the European Union. And in fact, Brazil, which is a market we're very engaged in when it comes to decentralized and self-sovereign identity, um, has a very similar privacy act that even goes a step further. So it started a wave um, of thinking and, you know, the awareness it's just creating globally is also a factor. But yeah, I mean, I guess the sort of good news about it is, you know, again, the concept of a reusable digital identity is not just good for individuals. And again, I think this is why it's really important that we have companies with clearly stated values that are driving this industry forward, because it could go, it could be used in a very bad way, I guess, if you just sort of look at the technology and the concept. But, you know, it's good for the top line, it's good for the bottom line. So we're seeing innovation globally, and in all the markets that you've named, there are clearly uh, forward movements towards reusable digital ID. Um, if you look at SingPass in Singapore, that's, you know, one of the success stories. Brazil has one of the most abundant growing fintech markets and just innovation markets. And there's tons of need to include more of their uh, citizens into these emerging ecosystem, whether they're financial or what have you. Um, and there's a lot of innovation going on. The government is moving forward with supporting identity initiatives. Even in the U.S., where, you know, we have a very fragmented system, we do see certain states, even Florida, you know, moving forward with mobile driver's license. Um, so there's there's innovation happening globally. And overall, if you look at the big picture, if it's tied together with a responsible ecosystem that's putting the individual at the center, um, it's going to be, you know, good news uh, when we look at the long game. So, Sarah, I'm, I'm so fascinated by... You're really fresh and unique thinking here. Let's talk a little bit about your background. How did you come? You said you accidentally fell into the world identity. I think almost all of us can say the same. Um, artist, engineer, legal wonk, politico. Where'd you come from, Sarah Clark? How'd you get here? Well, I have, from a professional standpoint, my background is in product management, and I love the field. Uh, you know, I'm passionate just about sort of the mechanics of product management. But I was head of product at a company here in San Diego called MyTech. 
if you live in the U.S., which you do, but um, maybe not all the listeners do, uh, and you capture a photo of your check, which of course are dying, but many years ago they were still quite widely used, um, to deposit it into your bank account, that was MyTech's core product. And rightfully so, they were a big part of spearheading the growth of mobile banking, quite successful, I joined, and we needed a new you know, place to expand our product into. So we found this little interesting use case called Identity, where we could use the same technology to use the camera on your phone to capture a photo of your ID document to prove you are who you claim to be. So we started to go into that business, and I got involved in the global community around identity and uh, you know, grew a very nice business at my tech, but more broadly just got interested in the topic and wanted to do more in the ecosystem. And long story short, that led me to eventually you know, have a great run at my tech, grow that business, but leave that role and kind of seek broader experience in, in the field. Um, you know, I've always been a person that, you know, thrives on purpose and, you know, impacting someone's life. So for me, it's like this great, you know, joining of my passion for product and technology and being part of the technology sort of sector, uh, but pairing that with sort of a design desire to be having a real impact. So I love it. I see this as the industry I'm going to retire out of at some point, but not anytime soon because I think we have a lot of work left to do. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Smarter Markets and our continuing examination of digital identity and its role in building a trust-based economy. Please help us get the word out about the podcast by leaving your ratings and reviews on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. Your support and engagement means the world to us, as does your help spreading the word about smarter markets via social media and word of mouth. On behalf of ABEX, I'm Michelle Dennity. See you again next week. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets. For free episode transcripts, visit smartermarketspod.com. Smarter Markets is 100% listener-driven, so please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Smarter Markets, its producers, sponsors and hosts, Eric Townsend and Abex Technologies, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets. 